Good morning to you and welcome to Christ the King. A happy Thanksgiving weekend to all of you. Great to be together this morning uh, worshiping our Lord, celebrating His kingship over all creation on this Christ the King Sunday. So let's stand together now and use these words from Psalm 47 as God, through His Word, calls us into His presence to worship Him. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing to Him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations, God is seated on His holy throne. our voices and proclaim that you are indeed the king over all creation. When you offered yourself once and for all as a sacrifice for our sins on the cross, you sat down at the right hand of God the Father, taking the seat of honor and authority over all creation. We acknowledge your rule in our lives. We acknowledge your rule over all of creation, and we wait with eager expectation for your triumphant return where you will bring your people to yourself, where every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you, King Jesus, are Lord. Amen. Whom do we worship as our Lord and King? We worship Jesus Christ as our Lord and King, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. center aisle as you have a seat. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, in this season of Thanksgiving, we are reminded that you are good and your steadfast love endures forever. Lord, we are grateful for the strength to reflect Christ's love through intimate fellowship and relationships as we experience your sustaining grace. Be patient with us as we desire to know you better and help us to live obediently amidst a world in desperate need for your truth. We also thank you for the provision of our daily needs and ask for wisdom to never take such blessings for granted or to assume that they come from our own merit. In our city, we continue to give you thanks for the star of hope 
and the men and women who serve this community dedicated to meeting the needs of the homeless and their children. Please give these servants strength and endurance to boldly share the gospel truth and model the love of Christ to those in very difficult circumstances. Lord, please work mightily in the lives of these men and women in need and transform their hearts and minds to follow you and to be encouraged in spiritual growth, employment, life management, and recovery from substance abuse. Father, we pray for the children at Star of Hope and ask that you comfort them as they long for stability and clarity of purpose. We pray this entire mission would be effective in guiding those who are lost and hurting to experience true healing, internal peace, and eternal life. In our particular congregation, we continue to pray for Stevie Lynn, the newborn daughter of Ryan and Michaela Dugan. We give thanks for her ability to go home this past week and pray that her body and lungs would continue to be strengthened. We pray even now that she continue to know your love and feel your saving grace. Father, grant us your peace and allow us to worship you today in spirit and in truth as we lift these petitions to you in the one name that saves, Jesus Christ. Amen.
go now to a time of confession of sin, I'd invite you, if you would like to or are able to, to utilize the kneelers that are on the chairs in front of you. This confession is a, a litany. It is a, a call and response. So I would just encourage you to uh, utilize the part there that says, people, I'm going to give you some time uh, towards the end for a little bit of silent ref- reflection. But let's now uh, go to the Lord and pray together. Lord, when the prophet Isaiah was confronted with your holiness, he exclaimed, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Without your mercy, we too are lost. Forgive us for the sins that we commit so readily our haughtiness toward other people, our neglect of those whom you call us to love, our worship of idols, those lesser gods that we try to find satisfaction in. Take a moment now and reflect on those things in a time of silent confession. that is on the chair to the far left of your row and to record your attendance with us. We'd love to know that you're here. A couple of announcements this morning um, before the Grays get to share uh, some, some great news about a great ministry of Christ the King. The first is, is that preaching this morning is Brooks Harwood. Many of you know Brooks already uh, and his family, Meredith, is on our children's ministry team Brooks is the RUF campus minister at the University of Houston, uh, and he and his family worship here with us on a weekly basis here at Christ the King, so we're excited to have Brooks with us this morning to preach God's Word, and um, we know that y'all will welcome him uh, and hear God's Word from him. Second, uh, this is the, the last Sunday before the season of Advent starts, next Sunday, December 3rd. Advent is not Christmas. Uh, It is a season of preparation for Christmas. It is a season of preparing our hearts for the coming of Jesus at Christmas. And we would love to help you do that through you taking one of these Advent devotionals, uh, one per family. Uh, These are opportunities for you to utilize for yourself, and they're they're for all ages, uh, from the youngest of us to the oldest of us throughout the season of Advent. So we invite you to take one of these. They're on the welcome table. I hear that if you're coming to the women's Christmas dinner, you're going to receive one of these. But if you're not, we'd love for you to pick one of these up and take it with you and utilize it for the season of Advent. Also, as you may have known, uh, this fall we've been going through some of the aspects of the impact of your financial generosity to Christ the King and how it is actually impacting lives. And so to share a little bit more about that, uh, Jessica and James Gray are going to share a little bit about the impact of the preschool at Christ the King. So thanks, y'all. All right. <laughs> Good morning. Like Clay said, we're here to kind of talk about the preschool here at Christ the King. We started attending Christ the King because of the preschool. Um, I remember learning about the preschool after attending the indoor playground with my boys one morning. And so I went on the website and I found Katie Whitehead's name and I emailed her um, and I scheduled a tour as fast as I could for our oldest, Andrew, who was two at the time. After some time in prayer, after the tour, we decided to keep Andrew at his current school. Once Andrew started back at his current school that fall, we felt that God was nudging us back to the preschool. So I immediately reached back out to Katie and um, realized that, you know, God was working through all these decisions and we ultimately decided to move Andrew to the preschool in that following school year. Fast forward a little bit, each year the preschool um, come up to sing during one of the worship services on a Sunday morning, so we attended church that Sunday to watch Andrew. At that same time, we had it on our hearts to look for a new church home. We were looking for a church closer to home with a great children's ministry. We felt so welcomed that Sunday, and the preschool helped us feel connected to other families attending Christ the King. 
I remember walking out of church that church more, or that after, sorry, I remember walking out of church that morning and more than one family stopped to visit with us. After that Sunday, we decided to attend Christ the King for a month. We never left and joined as members a few months later. Once we regularly attended the church and became members, we were able to observe firsthand the alignment between the church and the school ministries. Uh, Katie and the preschool staff do such a great job with that, and it doesn't happen by accident. Fast forward a few years later, and Jess works part-time on the church staff supporting youth sports programs and the children's ministry. I've been involved with men's Bible study and uh, recently had the opportunity to begin service as a deacon. So we're just so thankful for the role that the, the preschool has played in our boys' early education, but also in our family's spiritual life in general. Your giving, in part, helps support this fantastic christ Center preschool and ministry. Uh, thank you so much for hearing part of our story this morning and supporting Christ the King. Thank you all so much. Let's pray together now for time of offering. Lord Jesus, we do thank you. Uh, we thank you for the way that the preschool at Christ the King impacts the lives, uh, not only of children, but also of their families. Uh, Father, the, the Bible verses that they come home memorizing, the songs that they sing in the car, uh, the things that they learn, uh, and the ways that those things permeate households, we actually do know that you tell us, Lord Jesus, that from the lips of children, uh, you ordain praise. And we're thankful for the ordained praise that come from the children at the preschool at Christ the King and also the children's ministry of Christ the King. We pray, Father, that you would sustain those ministries, Father, that you would draw those little ones to yourself, Father, and that you would use them. Even, even we pray, Father, we actually do long for some of the children that grow up in this church and some of the children that attend our preschool to become pastors and uh, and, and Bible teachers and, and missionaries and to, to, to represent you in this world. We pray, Father, that as we give gifts to you this morning, that you would set them to use for that end. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
The scripture reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 7, verses 13 through 25, and chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, and 38 to 39. It can be found on page 943 in the Black Bibles. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I, serve my, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of Mark, thanks for that reading. I don't know if he knew he was going to be reading that much, but there you go. A lot of a lot of the Bible there. Um, Good to be with you all this morning. Uh, My name is Brooks, as Clay said. If I don't know you, I'm glad you're here. Um, John just said, "Hey, if you can preach on Revelation seven, go ahead. But if you just want to preach on something random that you've already done, do that." And I said. Let me preach on Romans 7. So here we are. Um, You know, this is, I I will say, this is actually one of my favorite passages in the Bible, and I hope it's encouraging to you. I I think it it poses a question that I have, that you have, which is, how can God keep loving me? How can he keep giving me his care and giving me his love, especially in light of the fact that we sin, in light of the fact that we uh, are not always lovable. You know, a few years ago, uh, I think Sophie was probably three years old at the time, and uh, she had discovered chocolate for the first time, and she just wanted it always. And she, I walked in the room, it was probably like a Saturday morning, um, and uh, I'm getting ready to make her breakfast, and she goes, Daddy, can I have chocolate? And I'm a good parent, so I said, no, you can't have chocolate, you know? And so I walk away, I start making her real, you know, food, real breakfast, and she um, is on the couch, I come around the corner, and I see a full opened wrapper, a chocolate bar, it's in her mouth. She's looking at me, her eyes are wide, she knows she's done something wrong. I look at her and I say, hey, baby, you shouldn't have had the chocolate, I told you no, but I love you. 
give me the chocolate, you know? And I said, but don't worry, I love you. My first impulse was to tell her that I loved her. My first impulse was to reassure her the fact that she hadn't lost my love. She had done something wrong. She had done something she shouldn't have done. And that's precisely the moment she needs to be told, you've done something wrong, but I still love you. But that's us with God. That's completely us with God. We have said things, we have thought things, we have done things that if they were on this screen right now, we would leave. If they were projected up there right now, we would walk out. And so we need to hear what Paul says here. Paul spends the majority of this letter convincing Christians in Rome of this one point. How can you be considered righteous before God when you're not righteous? And he gets right here in the middle of the letter to talk about the fact that we still sin, and yet God keeps loving us in spite of it. So if you're going to walk away with anything, I want you to walk away with this. First thing, that real believers really struggle with sin. The second thing, you're not defined by the worst thing that you've ever done. And the third thing, there's actually nothing you can do to separate you from the love of God in Christ. So real believers really struggle with sin, and then you're not defined by the worst thing you've done. There's nothing you can do to separate you from the love of God in Christ. It's fascinating, right before this, we didn't read this, but Paul, uh, he starts building a case. He starts talking about the fact that the law of God can't make us righteous, that we actually can't earn our righteousness before God by keeping God's law. And so this rhetorical question comes up right before this, which is, is the law worth it then? Is the law of God good? If it can't actually make me good before God, what's the point of it? And Paul begins to say, yeah, there's actually nothing wrong with God's law. The problem is you and me. We're the problem. We, because of our sin, we defy and reject and push against God's law, so we can't keep it. The problem's with us. And then he says what he says here in Romans 7. And the question that, that many theologians have had is this. Who is Paul talking about? Is he talking about himself? Or is he talking about maybe before he was a Christian? Is he talking about somebody else? And, and here's the deal. Most people struggle to believe that this is Paul talking about himself in large part because it's hard to believe that a spirit-filled believing on Jesus kind of person would actually struggle with sin this way. But here's some reasons that I think that Paul's actually talking about himself. Every single verb is in the present tense of this passage. He's not talking about the past, he's talking about the present. And then every single pronoun that's used is I and me. It's in the first person. Verse 14, I am of the flesh. Verse 15, I do not understand what I do. I do not do what I want. Verse 17, now it's no longer I who do it. Verse 18, I have the desire to do what's right. Verse 19, the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. And then verse 24, wretched man that I am. Not wretched man that I was, that I am. Paul's talking about himself. He's not talking about somebody else. Nor is he talking about himself in the past. He's talking about himself right now. Verse 22 talks about how he delights in God's law. Later on in chapter eight, he says that someone who does not have the Holy Spirit cannot delight in God's law. He's talking about himself as a Christian right now, deeply struggling with sin. And, and by the way, Augustine, Calvin, Luther, they all said this was Paul. This is a real Christian really struggling with sin. And he's having a hard time because what, what's it like? What's his experience like? It seems like addiction. That's what it seems like. Look, I mean, I, I looked up the definition of addiction, so here you go. Addiction is an inability to stop using a substance or to stop engaging in a behavior even though it may cause psychological or physical harm. Look at verse 15, it says, I don't understand my own actions for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Verse 18 and 19, for I have the desire to do what's right, but I don't have the ability to carry it out. I don't understand, or I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. He keeps doing things he doesn't wanna do. That's addiction. Verse 21, so I find this law that when I wanna do right, evil lies close at hand. There's like this addictive power, this background whispering that keeps pulling him back to something that he doesn't want. And he does it anyway. 
Verse 23, I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. He's not talking about a a little feeling. He's talking about a war, a battle. And sometimes he gets beaten. He gets pulled into this. Wretched man that I am, he feels miserable. He's broken. He's beat down. It's fascinating he talks about law. If you notice this, he says the word law over and over and over again. And what is a law? A law is anything that actually drives your behavior. It tells you what to do. Like if you went to a museum later on today and it says, do not touch this painting. That's the law. You might want to touch it. Um, You know, traffic lights, it's red. Stop, you don't go. We tell Sophie not to run in traffic. Why? Because we don't want her to be hurt. June lately has just been like trying to hurl herself off our couch. So we're like, June, get on your bottom, you know? Law, we're giving her laws to drive her behavior. And he talks about this too. And he says, in many ways, God's law is driving his behavior, but he talks about another law. It's another law that tells him what to do. It's a force or a principle that drives him. Verse 22, I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind. In verse 25, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. He's being told what to do, and he gives in at times. Paul's struggle as a real Christian is real. You know, years ago um, when we lived in St. Louis, we dog sat for uh, some friends of ours, and their dog was named Jaber, Jaber was, I don't know, this Dalmatian mutt, crazy, goofy, wild dog, you know. They told us, hey, when you leave the house uh, at any point in this weekend, put him in his crate. He'll be fine. So we did. Um, I don't remember what we went off to do, but uh, Meredith and I put Jaber in his crate. We went out uh, and we come back. We open our door and they're greeting us as Jaber. He's wagging his tail. He's super excited that we're home. I'm like, number one, I thought we put you in your crate. Number two, did someone break in? And that, did that person, does he like dogs, you know, and released you? Like, I don't know how you got out of this crate. And I walk around the corner and I see Jaber's crate. And it looks like a bomb has gone off. There's parts everywhere. Jaber had broken out of his crate. I don't even know why, I don't even know how. And what I didn't tell you is we walk over into the kitchen And there I see empty plastic wrappers because what Meredith and I had done, we had laid out frozen chicken breasts on the counter and Jaber wanted those chicken breasts so badly that he destroyed his crate, ran into the kitchen, ate the frozen chicken breasts and I turn around and I see Jaber, his head is down, tails between his legs and he's shaking because he knew he'd been a bad boy. That's us with sin. That's what Paul's describing. He's saying you want it and you know it's going to hurt you. You know there's gonna be consequences, but you do everything you can to be able to get it. And he's saying this is wretched. This is something I don't wanna be in and yet that's what we find ourselves in. Real Christians really struggle this way. Look, it, it dispels a few lies. There's, there's lies that we all believe um, about our Christian lives. The first lie. If I were a real Christian, I wouldn't be struggling this way. If I were a real Christian, I wouldn't be struggling this way. Um, You could say that Paul, not only is he a real Christian, he's a super Christian. He wrote 13 letters of the New Testament. We've kind of uh, clocked how many miles he probably traveled to do all of his missionary journeys that we find. He traveled over thousands of miles. It's like 10,000 miles on foot over the course of his Christian life to be able to tell people about Jesus. He loved God and he knew he was loved by God and yet here he is really struggling. And here's what's fascinating. God God doesn't stop loving us when we sin. The issue is that when we sin, we stop loving God. That's what Paul's trying to get across. But he's a real Christian. Another lie. If I were a mature Christian, I wouldn't be struggling this way. What's fascinating is that Paul, when he writes this in Romans, he's been a Christian at least 20 to 25 years. He's mature. 
He's known the Lord for a long time. There, there's a difference between progressive sanctification and progressive perfectionism. Progressive sanctification is just this biblical idea that we find that when the Holy Spirit actually comes in a believer, makes them more and more and more holy over time, but imperfectly with various successes and failures with sin. That's what the Bible describes. But there's this other version that we kind of maybe are prone to fall into or that maybe your different traditions you come from put forward, which is progressive perfectionism. This says that the real mark that you're a Christian is that over time, you will stop struggling with sin. It won't even be there. You will be perfect on this side of heaven. And that completely defies a passage like this in the Bible. Like, you and I need to become free to stop being so surprised when we sin or when other people sin. Like, how could they have said that racist thing? That, that just inconsiderate thing? How could they have done that? How could I have looked at that again and again? How could, why do I even think about this? Why is this in my mind? How is this even possible? I can't believe I could do that. But mature Christians struggle with sin. The other lie that it dispels is this. My struggle with sin is proof that God doesn't love me. Here's what's fascinating. Your struggle with sin might actually be proof that God does love you. Here's why. The key word struggle. Paul over and over is talking about the fact that he doesn't like this. He doesn't like what he's stuck in. It's a war. It's a battle. It's something that he's trying to get out of. He doesn't love what he's doing. What is true is that if you and I defy God and we don't care at all about it for a long amount of time, then maybe, maybe you have not experienced the love of God. Maybe you haven't experienced that, but this experience, when you and I fail and we push against God's law and we sin and we just don't like it, we're like, what did I do? Why did I do that? That's actually proof that God's love is pulling you back to himself. Tim Keller, he once said that sin for the believer is like a wounded bear. What he meant by that was that um, a happy, healthy bear is not a problem for us. If you come in a clearing and a happy, healthy bear is there, that's no big deal. But if a wounded bear is there, they're gonna lash back. What's happened with the cross is that sin has been wounded in you and it's lashing back with its final breaths. It knows and it pulls and it struggles because it's almost done with. Your struggle with sin isn't proof that God has stopped loving you. It's actually proof that he's continuing to love you. He's pulling you back. Real Christians, they really struggle with sin. You're also not defined by the worst thing you've ever done. This is what's so fascinating, what Paul does. He makes a separation between who he really is and then what he sometimes does. You notice this in verse 16. <clears throat> he says things like this over and over and over again, but he says, now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it's good. So now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. In verse 20, he says something really similar. He says, now if I do what I don't want, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. He's not removing his responsibility, by the way, He's just removing his identity from what he's struggling with. He's saying, this isn't really who I am. I'm something more, I'm something deeper. What's he defined by? He's not defined by what he's done, he's defined by what Jesus has done. That's what he begins to say. He says this over and over, and that's why at the very end of, of chapter seven, he starts saying, who will save me? He calls out to Jesus. He, he actually stops relying on himself. He stops depending on himself to gain who he is, and he starts relying on Jesus. And that's why he says in chapter eight, this amazing thing over and over, he says, verse one, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. They can't be condemned. Well, why not? This is an incredible verse, but verse three, because God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. 
He's saying you and I, in our flesh, in our sin, we actually can't obey God's law to the point we need to. And so God came here in Jesus to obey God's law for us and yet be treated as if he never did. He was a perfect law keeper, and yet at the end of his life, he was treated as if he was an imperfect law breaker. Why? Verse four, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Jesus actually fulfills our righteousness. At the end of Jesus' life at the cross, he does not say, keep struggling, keep, keep going, keep working, keep striving. That was Buddha's last words were keep striving. He doesn't say stop sinning. He doesn't say be better. He doesn't say any of that. He says it is finished. Jesus' words on the cross were it's done. And what, what did he finish? He finished sin's debt against you, but he also finished God's righteousness for you. It's all done. It's all finished. God can't stop loving you because he actually looks at Jesus and he sees him as perfect and so he sees you as perfect. This is amazing. I mean, when, when you and I are worrying if God might stop loving us, we have to stop looking at ourselves and start looking to Jesus. You know, you might have heard uh, about this, but uh, in the 70s, um, a man named Rick Hoyt was born. Rick was a uh, spastic quadriplegic with cere cerebral palsy, so his um, muscles didn't work properly. And uh, he, he couldn't walk, he was in a wheelchair his entire life. Uh, and when he was in middle school, he came to his dad, Dick, and he said, Dad, um, I really wanna run uh, in a race. Can you push me through a race? And so his dad agreed. His dad ended up uh, doing a little bit of training, never really ran in his life, and he ran a five mile race, pushing, pushing his son in a wheelchair the entire time. And after that race, Rick said this, Dad, when I'm running, it feels like I'm not handicapped. After their initial five mile run, Dick and his, uh, his dad began running every day. He began, began training, he put cement bags in a wheelchair while his son was in school just to be able to um, emulate the, the weight and he got faster and he got stronger. And so their next race was a Boston Marathon. It's a 26.2 mile trek through downtown Boston. Dick pushed Rick the entire way. Uh, the next race was a triathlon. This is a one mile swim, a 40 mile bike ride and a 20 mile run. Dick swam a mile pulling his son on a raft. He biked 40 miles with a bike with his son riding along and then he pushed him 20 miles on a run. Then they did an Ironman, that's 2.4 mile swim, that's a 112 mile bike ride and then a 26.2 marathon. Over the next 39 years, Dick would carry his son through 1,130 endurance events, including 72 marathons, six Ironman triathlons, 32 instances of the Boston Marathon, and they were inducted in the Ironman Hall of Fame. This is what Dick said about his son. He's the one who's motivated me because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be out there competing. What I'm doing is I'm loaning Rick my arms and my legs so he can be out there competing like everybody else. This is the gospel. You can't run this race. I can't run this race. And so Jesus ran it. He actually carries us through it. He pulls us through it and we do fall down and we do mess up. And he says, stop looking at yourself and look to me. I'm pulling you through. Well, if, if this was true, it, it is true, but if, it, if you believe this were true, what would that do to you? The first thing it should do is you should stop hating yourself. It earns you nothing with God. When Sophie defies me, it is right if she feels bad about that, it's not right for her to stay in that because she doesn't earn any of my love by feeling bad. I love her because I've chosen to love her as her father. That's what, that's what God's done. You can stop kicking yourself. He can't love you anymore because he looks at you and he sees Jesus. He sees you as a perfect son or daughter. He's pulling you through. It also means we have to stop relying on ourselves. I mean, it, you notice this, Paul, he's kind of come to the end of himself. He says, who's gonna save me? It's not me. He says, Jesus has to do this. And what's fascinating, this, this can be overlooked, but it's not just him relying on Jesus. It's him relying on each other. 
And you might ask, well, where is that? He's writing a public letter about personal sin. Imagine Paul writes this, how many people afterward would have been like, Paul, are you doing okay? Can I help you? He's come to the point where he's actually willing not just to rely on God, but to rely on God's people. We have to rely on God's people, yes, or God, yes, but we also have to rely on God's people. That's how he meets us. We rely on each other. We also have to stop numbing. It's what we end up needing, needing the most, right? When, when we numb, all that is is just another version of self-reliance and self-hate. It's when you feel bad, when I feel bad, I just pour myself into whatever. Work, busyness, sex, religious devotion. It can be good or bad things, and you just pour yourself in it just to feel a little better, but it won't work. It never does. We think it will, but it won't. You know, it's like we think it, you know, it'll make it all better, but it doesn't. You are not the thoughts that you hate. You're not the things that you despise about yourself. You're not the worst things you've done. That's not who you are. And there's nothing that we can do to separate us from the love of God in Christ. That's what he ends with. It's impossible for God to stop loving you. That's what he says in verse 38. In verse 39 of chapter eight, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know what's in creation? Paul. There's nothing Paul can do to separate him. You know who else is in creation? You. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to separate yourself from his love. Why? The simple reason is that he's already seen the worst of you and decided to die for you anyway. He's already seen the worst of me and he decided to die for me anyway. The beautiful thing about having kids, you start reading books that you never would read on your own. Corduroy the Bear is a great book. And it, it is this, it exemplifies this. Here's the, the basic story of Corduroy the Bear. Corduroy is this little bear in a department store. Um, this girl named Lisa wants to buy him. Her mom says, you know, we've already spent too much, we can't, and by the way, Corduroy has a broken shoulder strap, his overalls are broken, so you don't want him. So they leave, and so Corduroy wakes up and he doesn't know this, he doesn't know that he's broken, and so he spends the rest of the book, the rest of the story, trying to find a button, trying to fix himself, trying to prove that he's, he's purchased, you know, that he's worthy to be purchased. And he doesn't succeed. He doesn't find this button. You see where I'm going, right? The next morning, he wakes up and there Lisa is. And Lisa says, I actually took my whole piggy bank and I, 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 I've spent it all and I'm gonna buy you and bring you home. And then she gives him the button that he needs. She fixes his overalls. She saw him when he actually was broken and yet spent everything she had to buy him. That's exactly what God has done in Jesus. He's seen you when you were broken. He's seen all the bad things about you that you hate, that you don't want other people to see, and yet he still died for you anyway. So the, the key is this. Then why now, when you sin, would he change his mind? He won't. He can't. You're his. You and I can be patient with ourselves and with each other because God's been so patient with us He's been so kind to us. We can actually be compassionate toward what people are going through and be less judgmental because he's locked himself in with us like this. It just gives us so much more. We can also be honest. We can be way more honest than we ever were. At the end of the day, I really shouldn't care what you think of me because the God of the universe thinks so highly of me because of what he's done in Jesus. Not because I deserve it, but because of him. So I can be honest with you. You can be honest with me. You can be honest with each other. That's what Paul's doing. He's trying to model this right here. And at the end of it all, what's so amazing about this is that if you accept this, this is true of you, you get to remind people of these things. Like when people really fail, when they really sin, when they do the things they hate, you get to say, hey, 
real Christians, they really struggle. And you're not that struggle. You're not defined by that. You're more. And you actually can't do anything to separate you from the love of God in Christ. It flips the question. The question in the beginning for all of us is how could God keep loving me? Um, The real question is how could he not? Because of what Jesus has done. He's gonna keep loving you because of him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this gift. Thank you that you've done everything we need uh, to be able to be lovable and, and worthy and righteous before God. Thank you for earning that for us and then saying, I'm never gonna let you go. Um, Father, I pray this would give us calm, this would give us peace, this would give us joy, this would help us to actually treat others in that same light. Thank you for this gift. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. One of the proofs, really, and one of the evidences of God's continued love for his people is before you on this table, because God says that when we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we are participating in the body and blood of Jesus. By faith, we are both being reminded of his sacrificial love for us on the cross, and we're also being strengthened by his power to continue that battle with sin, not through our own strength and power, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you are a follower of Jesus, if you've trusted in him, come and eat and drink and be strengthened for this journey. If you're here this morning, we suspect and hope that there are many among us who have not yet come to that point in time where they have, you've trusted and placed your faith and trust in the Lord. I would invite you to do that even now. Make today the day of your salvation. There are prayers in the order of worship that can help you to do that. You may come forward in this time if you wish with your arms crossed and receive a prayer or a blessing, or you may remain seated and uh, pray and contemplate those things that you've heard this morning. And now the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. We thank you and we praise you, O oh Lord that you sent your son Jesus to die for us while we were yet sinners. You died for us, Lord Jesus. We did not make ourselves beautiful for you, but you are making us beautiful. You are forming us more and more into the image of your son, and you're using this meal to do it, and I pray that you would use this this meal and this time to that end. In Christ's name, amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he gave thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take it, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we do show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. Therefore, let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The gifts of God are for the people of God. Come and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
the flames They will not consume you up your hands and your heads and your hearts and receive this blessing. Go from this place into the world to serve our God and King. We go in the name of Christ. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you all. Thanks be to God. Amen. Praise God from who